There you go. That's a little better. We got five people that time. Uh, let's come over, if you would, please, and go back over just a couple of things, if we could. We're talking about your fellowship with the Lord and the importance of it and uh, the reasons that we do the things that we do uh, as far as um, our relationship with the Lord is concerned. And uh, the importance of maintaining the ground. Come to Matthew chapter 13. And uh, I've, I've said this already and I, it bears repeating. Um, there's nothing wrong with the seed. And if they can get you to focus on the seed, then you got your focus in the wrong place. The focus is on the ground. You can't control the seed. The seed is perfect. It's pure. It's the word of God. That's what he's likening that to. But I want to go back over just a couple of things here to show you how important it is for you to make sure that the ground is properly prepared. If you want the Word of God to do anything for you, I had the privilege of meeting with some people just this past weekend, and the emphasis was on the importance of the Bible and the utilization of the Bible and why the Bible is so important in your Christian life. And you can tell the individuals that cling to it and the ones that don't and the individuals that it has an impact on and the ones that don't. Brother Brad, let me give you this before I, somebody found this in the parking lot. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. So I guess that's on our property, so it's ours now. But <laughs> anyway, if you could take a look at that. So, so one of the things that happens is, is in modern everyday preaching nowadays, the emphasis is always on somewhere or somebody else. It never does seem to be on us being the problems. And I've told you before and I've repeated to you numerous times that the truths in the Bible, including the odd things, you know, the angels that don't have wings and the, uh, the things that are in the Bible in Genesis 6 and Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 and Job 38 and even all the way out to the things in the book of Revelation, those things are really not hard to believe. They're not hard to, to, uh, to justify. But when it comes to the Lord putting his finger in your heart and saying, Thou art the man, those are the difficult truths in the Bible when it comes to your personal relationship with him. And a preacher that's constantly drawing uh, your attention to those things is the right kind of preacher. Now, a preacher that never wants to draw attention to things that he's opposed to or can't always get along with everybody, that's a, a hireling. That's not a preacher. A biblical preacher has a responsibility to find the spirit of the age and go directly diametrically opposed to it. And so when you see the things that are going on in the world today, and some of you, I, I realize, because you've been raised in a modernistic world, that you think a church is supposed to be involved in politics. And then you come here and find out we don't discuss politics. You say, why? This is God's time. God puts in who he wants to put in and takes out who he wants to take out. And I'm not going to spend a bunch of time talking about whatever candidate's going to be running for whatever it's going to be. You say, well, well why is that? It doesn't amount to a row of pins. And it gets into personal opinions and it gets into prejudices. And you can't justify the things in the Bible because you don't know the individual. And so we stay away from those kinds of things. You have a modernistic view that nowadays you have a non-gender specific uh, world that you live in and a preacher is supposed to not say anything about queers or about homosexuality or about lesbianism or about uh, sexual immorality you're not supposed to talk about uh, people that are shacking up instead of being married you're not supposed to do that anymore that's politically incorrect now and even people that have been in church for years and years and years and now their kids are that age and then they get offended because their kids are now doing what they used to be against See how you just reacted to that? You say, but preacher, you know, what if it runs them off? You See, there's the problem. When the Lord says, thou art the man, you know what you have to say? You're right. But you don't negate the fact that it's still wrong to do, even if you're doing the wrong. Uh, preacher Lackey used to say, he used to say, uh, if I can't say oh, me, uh, amen, I'll say oh me. Meaning I'm not running from it if it's the absolute truth. Well, it's still wrong to do that. Well, preacher, you know, you know, it's like the, the guy said one time in a DUI trial. And the guy, I've blown something way off the map, 18 or 19 and four or five times the legal limit. That Back then it was 10, so I guess maybe twice the legal limit. And then they dropped it to eight. But at any rate, we're in there. And the guy gets up in closing argument. And then the witnesses are able to come in. And I was particularly interested in this one because it was the third time the guy had been arrested for it. But they can't bring that up. 
during the trial. And so he asked for a jury trial and drugged the whole thing out. And I'll never forget the closing argument of his defense. And his defense was, is not that the guy didn't do it, but of you people sitting here in this jury, uh, I bet you that there's not one of you that hasn't driven home at times and you've been tipsy. And so if you've done that before, you have no right to find this guy guilty. That was his justification. Not that the guy did it and blew, and the evidence was there that the guy blew 18 or whatever it was, and not that he was all over the road and wrapped his uh, car around a telephone pole. None of that, none of that stuff mattered. It's now you folks, you've, you've driven home, you're on the jury, you've, you've driven home drunk before, and you just didn't get caught. And, and so you know what you should do? You should have, so find him not guilty? No, he's still guilty, whether you've done it or not done it. Now, the thing you have to recognize about that is, is that if you're guilty, you don't negate the truth just because it makes you uncomfortable. And the first thing that'll happen is, like I told you, my mom was famous for, every time you point a finger at somebody, there's three coming back at you. When a preacher preaches that to you, he's not preaching from a standpoint of he's clinically sterile and he's done everything right and he's perfect and he's pure. He's just simply preaching to you what truth is. And if you're guilty of that, then you have to get that thing in line and you have to plow the ground and get the, uh, the ground prepared for the seed. Otherwise, the seed does you no good at all. The Bible teaches you clearly that the Bible only works, it effectually works in you and them that believe. That belief means an understanding, and we'll talk about in the regular morning service this morning, when he says uh, uh, that the understanding, that means you understand the application of how it fits you. I can believe it, but understanding it is. That's why when it comes to parables in the New Testament here, when the Lord comes along, He preaches to them and they understand not. What? They don't see the connection. The connection is, is how's this thing fit with me? Not how does it fit with somebody else? You want to have good ground? It's, Lord, what are you doing in my life? Not my parents' life, not my parents' politics, not my parents' prejudice, not my boyfriend, not my girlfriend, not my husband, not my wife, not my children, not what's politically correct. None of that. When it comes to you doing that, ladies, the understanding is, as Lord, me, talk to me. And when you do that, now your ground is soft. So then when the seed goes in there, the seed has an opportunity to begin to do the thing that it's trained to do. What does that seed wants to do? That seed wants to take root and it wants to produce fruit. That seed is on a mission. When that seed is sown, that seed is, I'm putting that in there for a purpose. It's not just to grow up and have a shade tree there. It's for the purpose of doing something that will benefit other people. There's nothing wrong with the seed. The seed always tries to regenerate. The problem's the ground. And so I just wanted to go back over some of the things with the ground here and recognize that when I go over some of these things, I realize some of the things are personal. I understand some of the things that I say nowadays. They sound like old-fashioned as a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And I, I realize that people think, well, they've been saying this stuff for years. Well, just because they've been saying stuff for years and times have changed, but truth hasn't changed. <laughs> times have changed, but truth hasn't moved at all. You don't adjust truth to the time. That's situational ethics. But preacher, we live in a more modern world today and you have to adapt. Now, where did you get that theology? That's not biblical theology. Amen. Biblical theology is, as I stand on the Word of God, I stay within the parameters of the Word of God. And so, you know, you don't see movie screens and you don't see smoke machines and you don't see electric instruments and all that kind of stuff. You say, but preacher, we live in a modern time. And if you want to reach people, oh, there's people, aren't you a people? I think there's people here, but I mean reach masses. See, not at the sacrifice, not, not by sacrifice and truth you don't. Amen. You don't do it for the sake of entertainment. Well, preacher, you know, a lot of churches you know you go to now, they spend, you know, 30 minutes in entertainment and 15 minutes in the Bible. You got it backwards. So you're drawing people in with entertainment. Get your coffee and drink. Let me ask you a question. This is just a, just a, a, a hypothetical when you go to work, you show up at work and then they entertain you for an hour and a half or two hours. You get coffee and donuts and bagels and cinnamon rolls and all that kind of stuff. And, and then when you get good and comfortable, uh, just before lunchtime, you sit down for about maybe 15 or 20 minutes and do a little bit of work until it's time for your two-hour lunch break. And then, 
you come back, you got to have a little evening break, afternoon break, because you're tired and wore out, you know, right before 4.30 when the bell, bu- is that what they do? Now, you know, you think, preacher, that just sounds absolutely ridiculous, but that's what people have grown to expect from church. They walk in for entertainment. What do you have for the kids? Preaching. Teaching. What? The Bible. Well, in other places, they give out candy and they give out gummy bears and they play ping pong, ping pong and pool and pinballs and what all else it is. Okay, fine. The fact that you just said that bothers me because you're trying to manipulate me. And all that does is make me set the plow down harder and I begin to sing the song, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. You're not going to give me some kind of worldly ex lax and make me be moved off of that position because I know that position is the right position. We're yes. just getting old and stubborn. Thank you. Amen. I don't intend to turn loose of it. This is what got us where we are. You don't turn loose of it because the world comes in and goes, you can't do things like that anymore. Said who? Where do you get that? Why are you so uncomfortable with that? Well, my kids are coming here now and that kind of a thing. And, and, and you think the world is going to adjust to your kids? Why should the church adjust to your kids? Well, they might want to go somewhere else if they don't come here. Okay, well, you're their parent. And once they grow up, if they make that decision, God doesn't kill their free will once they're saved but at least they have a place to come back to without all the frills and the spills and all that. What do you got? An old man that gets up there, looks like Krabby Appleton sometimes, and he's got a scour on his face. Pretty sure what's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong with me. I'm just thinking this morning. And it's hard for me to think and talk at the same time. <laughs> so it affects my face uh, every now and then. But you have to get accustomed to that. I, it takes time to knock the world off of you. You're inundated with all the stuff every day. It's a modernistic way of thinking. It's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that's what messes up the ground. And some of you, you got a lot of thorns and thistles, and when the seed goes in there, thorns and thistles have a reason. Stones, all they do is, is choke the root. Thorns and thistles are there to kill the fruit. And some of you, you try to get the seed sown, but you're trying to sow it among the thorns and the thistles. You're trying to commingle this mindset that I can be a Christian and still be in the world. Amen. The Lord said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the, pride of li- the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He said, If you love the world, you're at enmity with Him. He said, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I can't think like the world. The modern church nowadays, is, it's, a, it's an area not where the tares are. That comes in just a little while. This is an area nowadays where it's not necessarily stones in the ground, and it's not even the hard ground. It's the thorns and the thistles. The pressure on a preacher today is, is to try to figure out some kind of way to commingle what God's Word says with how the rest of the world feels. And so you're supposed to turn a blind eye to this modernistic way, this, this flesh fest of, uh, of, you know, we need to loosen up and need to relax a little. We need to chill out. Listen, our, our problem in nowadays is, is you're trying to make yourself conform harder to the world than conform to the Lord. Now, that's the truth of the matter. You're carnal. And then when the preacher gets up and says, you know what we need to do? You don't need to cut those thorns and thistles down. You need to plow them out before the seed even comes in. But what you're doing is, is in the passage here, I'll show you, the seed is sown among the thorns and the thistles. The thorns and thistles are already there. The ground is good enough to be able to grow something. But it's growing things that should not be in the ground. Well, the first thing that has to be done is preparation of the ground. And he likens those things in there to a multitude of things that we'll talk about here in a minute. And I want to go back over that before we close out this uh, last of the study here about the importance of your fellowship with the Lord and how you have to work on the ground. Uh, We are nothing but dirt bags. We're animated dirt balls. We're made from the dust of the ground. There's a lot to that. And because of that, you're always going to be running uh, uh, errands, a preacher used to say, you're running errands for a corpse. The corpse is no good. Where does the corpse go in the ground? Well, even if you decide to get it cremated, when you wind up throwing it out over the ocean or whatever, it goes back to the ground. 
dust to dust and ashes to ashes and so on and so forth. From dust thou art to dust thou shalt return. And that's what will happen. They put you in a box and set you in a crate and down you go and over a period of time there's nothing there but bones and leave it long enough even the bones will deteriorate. Your flesh is no good. Doesn't that feel inviting today? Your flesh is no good. You're rotten to the core. And what do we need? We need an intervention from the Lord to step in because if left to ourselves, even saved, we'll fulfill Galatians 5 and we'll do everything but go to hell when we're done with it. You say, why? Uh, selfish, meistic, every one of us. I'm not preaching as one that has attained. Every one of us. It's connected to feelings all the time. And so one of the things you have to do is pay attention to what? The ground. When's the last time you plowed it up? When's the last time you turned it over? The last time that you took a look at it. I remember one time I walked out early in the morning and we just finished with biscuits and red-eyed gravy and all the other kind of stuff that go with it. I remember seeing my, my uh, pawpaw there and he's got his foot up on the wall. I won't put it here, but he got his foot up on the wall and he's leaning over his knee this way. He's got his sun hat off there and, and he's looking out over the dirt out there. We hadn't even planted anything yet. Just got rows all in it out there. I mean, it looks pretty good. It smells, you can smell when the dirt's been turned over. And I was a little fella. I remember walking out there. I said, what you looking at, Papa? And he said, well, I'm just kind of laying out my garden. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, I'm watching how the sun hits. And he said, I believe that'll make a good stand for corn right there. And I said, did you plant corn there last year? He said, no, I planted corn over there. But he said... The corn didn't come up the way it ought to. It didn't tassel out on time. And he said, so I, I think the problem is, is I put the corn where it got too much shade in the evening time. And over there, I've watched it, and the sun will help it to grow better over there. That sun, that, that corn doesn't do good without uh, hours and hours and hours of sun. And then he starts laying the thing out that way through there. And he said, I think we need to go back there in that back corner again, and we need to plow back there. I said, we plowed that yesterday. And he said, yeah, but we didn't plow it deep enough because I'm going to plant some, uh, I think he said peanuts back there. And he said, and peanuts grow under the ground. And he said, so what you have to do is, is to be able to plow deep enough so the peanuts have plenty of room to run under the ground. And why are you saying that? When's the last time you looked at your field? What kind of crop did you produce last year? Is it possible because you planted the wrong thing in the wrong place and didn't give it the nutrients and the sunshine and the, 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 uh, the fertilizer and things that it needs? When's the last time you went out in the field? You haven't lived until you've done this. There's a trailer pulled out there one year and it stunk to high heaven. And the trailer was full of cow manure. And we went out there with a pitchfork and a shovel and threw that stuff. They didn't have spreaders back then. I was the spreader. <clears throat> and take that stuff off. You walk by the trailer there. You pull the trailer along and you're scattering it all along through there. And then <clears throat> he gets over there behind the uh, plow and he goes, okay, we're going to plow it in. I said, Papa, I'm going to be walking in, uh, uh, we used to call it cow apples. And uh, he said, I'm going to be walking in cow apples. And he said, yeah, you're going to smell like it by the time we're done. But he said, do you enjoy those vegetables that your Nana puts up? The corn and the beans and the taters and the peppers and so on and so forth. Yeah, he said, this is the secret. And then a couple of days later, another fertilizer, another uh, trailer comes in there. And it comes from a chicken house not far from him. And he's got chicken fertilizer. I'd rather have cow manure than chicken fertilizer. Chicken, chicken. It, it just, man, I mean, I'm even thinking about it now. I'm thinking, phew, man. Good thing I didn't eat breakfast this morning. And uh, that stuff spreads almost like uh, tobacco powder. Tobacco powder is real good for uh, using when they grind up tobacco. It's real good for uh, killing bugs and fungus and stuff like that. It's not good to chew or smoke, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Used to be in the South, you could never preach on tobacco because tobacco was the number one crop in the South. You'd have deacons stand out there at the between Sunday school and church and they'd stand out there and this was their this is how they look. Hey, how you doing today? Good to see you. Nice to see you. Good to see you. They'd never turn their back to you. 
I remember one time I ran into my daddy's office. I said, Daddy, the deacon's on fire. The deacon's on fire. And he said, what? I said, the deacon's on fire. And he went running out there. It was the deacon right here, and the smoke was coming up over the top. <laughs> he said, son, he's just uh, smoking cigarette, you know, that kind of thing. On church property, man, a deacon out there, you know, catch him and look like somebody smoking a joint, you know, and just making sure he's like nobody can see it. But anyway, that chicken manure came out. And I said, well, we already put down that. He said, it doesn't go in the same place. He said, if you put that on where we're gonna, what we're going to plant here, it'll burn up the plant. What's good for some plants isn't good for others. Some plants can tolerate hot fertilizer. Some plants need hot fertilizer in order to produce the fruit that they're trying to get out of them. And some plants can't take it. When's the last time you dug it and dung it? When's the last time you looked at the fruit? Been a while? You say, what fruit? I'm not even talking about souls. That's a great thing, but that's not fruit. That's a soul. I'll show you some fruit. Look in Galatians. Leave your finger here in Matthew. Just go a few pages over. I'll show you some fruit. You want to inspect your crop this morning? You can be assured that if the Lord is going to inspect your crop, He is not going to inspect it uh, the way you might think so. He's going to use the Word of God to, as the inspector. <laughs> the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even, dividing asunder, soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, one of the hardest things for me to understand is, is why something that is no good anymore to the cow and no good anymore to the chicken, why something like that being spread across a field would be so nutritious and so valuable to producing good fruit. I remember them having apple trees and plum trees, some of the sweetest plums I ever had, and peach trees, and putting that stuff all around those things and breaking that up, sticking a pitchfork in the ground, going around them and then scattering that stuff around there. And I mean, for a few days, man, I mean, smell to high heaven. No irrigation. You had to wait for rain to come. But boy, you come back at the right time of the year and those little things are budding and the flowers are just absolutely beautiful and the bees are buzzing. And then before long, a little, little tiny, old grape-sized little thing pops out almost overnight and then before long it swells up about the size of a golf ball and then it gets a little bit larger than that, about half the size of a baseball and they're just about where you could touch them and they'll come off of the thing and you've got to worry about the birds getting in them and all that and you take that, Papa will pick that thing off and bite into it and he'd say, she's ready. And you look down there and you're thinking, this is the same tree I put the cow manure on. This is the same tree that I tore up the roots so they could get air in there and get the nutrients in. This is the same tree that we dug around a little bit to make sure that the water got down to the roots. When's the last time you plowed your own taters? When's the last time you let the Lord come in there and drop the harrow down and stand on a little while and say, okay, let's plow. You say what? Plowing prepares the ground, and plowing oftentimes prepares the ground for fertilizer before you ever put anything in the ground. You ever had the Lord dump a, a, a load of smelly stuff on you? And you're wondering, where's Romans 8, 28? <laughs> I could do some illustrations. I really could if I, if I had the money and the time that these people do, these big evangelists and stuff like that do. I'd put a bag up here that says fertilizer and I'd call it 828. And I'd open it up and I'd let everybody just get you a handful and... <laughs> what in the world is that? It's fertilizer. Your ground's been stripped. The ground is not nutrient dense. It's been stripped by the thorns and the sisal. They've, th suck, they've sucked all of the beneficial nutrients out of it. You say, what does it take? It takes some dung. Dig it and dung it. Why? The tree's not producing fruit. But it's a nice looking tree. 
He's got on a suit and tie. He's got on some wingtips or boots or whatever. Got on a dress and three-quarter length sleeves and got the hair right and so on and so forth. But it's been a while since it produced fruit. Have you checked to see what kind of fruit you produce? I don't know. I can't tell you. Nobody can tell you. Only God and you know whether or not you're producing. You say what? Every one of them can be counterfeited. Notice in Galatians chapter number 5, we'll come back to Matthew chapter 13, but the fruit of the Spirit is not your fruit anyway. It's allowing Him to work in you if you want Him to. I got to thinking about this uh, when I was going through this whole thing and studying for it. I got to thinking we got ready to put that plow down and some places harder than others and some places contaminated more than others and all that and some places required work and cross plowing and this and that and the other across there and stuff and stomping on it and working on it and sticking a pitchfork in it, a shovel in it, and post hole diggers in it, and tearing the thing up, and sharpening the harrow, and going back through it, and back through it, and back through it, and turning it over, and scraping the stuff off with a pitchfork, and throwing it over in a burn pile, and, and getting all that. You know, it's a strange thing. Not one time did I ever hear that ground reject it. Not one time did I hear it oppose it, or stand up and say, hey, 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 stop tearing me up. Not one time did that ground say to us, stop plowing me. But if we're the ground, and we are, and the Lord gets ready to plow, how often do we say, whoa, you don't plow there. That's my own little special place of herbs and spices and things that I want over there. That's my own little secret garden. That's the place over there where I've, I got a, I've got a special little shrine for me. Come on, preacher. The ground's always in opposition. And the thorns and thistles begin to come up, and then we expect the seed to do anything. I've learned this about the seed. It doesn't grow well when it's in competition with everything else. You want to produce fruit? I do. Well, you're a preacher, you're supposed to. Yeah, but you remember when you were a Christian and you first got saved, do you remember you wanted to produce fruit? Nowadays it's shifted. Would you agree? Don't, don't shake your head now. You're going to find yourself in a bad spot here. So wait till you hear the question. It's shifted nowadays. Nowadays it's like, well, I, I, I want to produce fruit, but what's the cost? And I want to produce fruit, but, I, but I, I, I'm not sure how much I want to produce and how big a bumper crock I really want. And I'm, I'm just, I mean, it's shifted. Boy, from I don't care what I have to do to produce fruit to now it's, well, yeah, maybe a little. But does that mean I got to get rid of the thorns and the thistles? I don't know that I really want fruit that bad. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Do you love Him more than you used to? You're going to be in a passage today for a little while, Ephesians 2. You know what He has against that church? He said, you left your first love. Do you love Him like you used to love Him? Do you love Him more than you used to? If you loved him like you did when you first met him and you were so grateful for him, why is your commitment to him reduced? Amen. You, you've gotten socialized with the rest of the world and so now what happens is, is what you used to see is all out commitment. Now it's inconvenience. Boy, when you needed him, he was there for you and you loved him. Boy, I mean, you loved him. You witnessed to a fence post. But now it's like a little bit goes a long way. That's the fruit of the Spirit. When the Spirit comes along, you know what happens? He's always bragging on Jesus. Do you talk about Him like you used to? Remember when you first met your husband or first met your wife? You're telling everybody about them? And now you've been married six months? <laughs> and you hardly talk about them anymore? Your relationship with your Lord, does it grow a little bit cold? Well, maybe not. And Laodicea, you know what he says? He said, I would that you were cold or hot. But you're just kind of 
lukewarm. I'm like, eh, whatever. It ain't hot, it ain't cold, just, eh, no big deal. Love, joy, I'm not going to give you all of these. We've written some stuff, we've preached on this a whole bunch. Do you have a greater joy than you used to, or are you always trying to get it back? Boy, used to, no matter what came your way, you still have the joy, joy, joy down in your heart. We used to sing that song. If the devil tells you to sit on attack, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you know, did you have the joy? And nowadays, man, all he has to do is threaten attack, and it's like Eeyore Christianity. Everything's bad. No, it's not. I'm going to heaven. I should be grateful for my salvation. I think it was Dr. Seitler that made the statement, and he said, if you find out that you love something more than you love your salvation and the Lord, you're backslidden. Well, I've probably been backslidden for a couple months then. Because <laughs> you get your mind on something else, don't you? Justifiable, of course. And before long, that joy is drained out of you. And how about the next one that's there? I can piece the next one in the group. Tell me those aren't the first three things that people are looking for nowadays. A peace that passes understanding. You've got a world at war right now. I mean, you've got war going on everywhere in the world and every arena there is for it to go on. Everybody's in conflict and combat everywhere. Controversy all over the place. And you say, what is it? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is peace. I don't mean like... I mean real peace. A peace that passes all understanding. A peace that allows me to realize, well, the Lord's got it or he doesn't. Amen. And either way, I know where I'm going when I die. That's right. Amen. What happens if, and what happens if, what happens if? I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. Amen. You die of starvation, you go to heaven. You'll never be hungry again. Amen. What kind of peace do you have? Amen. Every time you flip on the news, do you get all twisted up you say well preacher what are you telling me I'm telling you your ground's bad he wants you to have peace yes. Amen. great peace have they which love thy do you know it law and what nothing, nothing shall I want that peace Amen. you know what that means uh, if I'm easily offended then peace is the, the results of that you say, why? Because I don't love his word. Why are you making the emphasis on the word? <laughs> You're almost making a bibliolater of me. And the way, that's his mind on paper. You find out when somebody goes through trouble, trials, tribulations, difficulties, persecutions, and all that, you can watch them for just a moment, and you can see if they draw close to that book or they start defending themselves. And if they draw close to the book and have a relationship with that book, then they'll get through it, and otherwise they're fighting on their own. Amen. Now let me just ask you this. I'm going to come back to Matthew 13. I'm going to have to wind things up here in a second. Those first three things out of nine fruits, just the first three, has your crop this year been better than it was this time last year? Do you have more love? Do you have more joy? Do you have more peace? Or has it gone the other way? Well, preacher, you know, the stuff that's happened to me, see, the problem's not the seed. The word didn't change while you went through what you went through. The problem is the ground's changed. And if God's right, that fertilizer should have produced a better crop, not a lesser crop, if all things work together for good. A good bag of 828. See, so what does it do? It gives you the right balance of all the nutrients that causes you to produce fruit that abounds to his account. Something he can look down there and say, hey, see that tree down there? Yep, man, look at that fruit. What's the tree get out of that? Nothing except for me coming down and saying I don't need to cut it down because it's still doing something for me. You want to read the rest of them that will make, kind of kind of make you nauseated. Long-suffering is there. Are you more long-suffering of people this year than you were last year? You do know people can be trying, don't you? There's times you can be trying too. 
you don't know, you have no idea what God may allow to happen in your life. And the next thing you know, you think you've got the tiger by the tail and you realize you grabbed the wrong end. And right when you think you've got everything under control and you've got all the answers to everybody else, that's why you're so critical of everybody else. And then all the one, you're the one chewing on your tongues and sitting strapped down to a gurney somewhere because you're the one lost your mind and acting like the man of maniac of Gadara. And the Lord said, what you going to do now? You got to be careful about that. One just tiny little bleed in your brain will change your personality forever. Just a tiny little bleed. One little misstep in your heart, a little AFib deal going on. Your heart misses a beat, and the next thing you know, you're laying in a hospital not knowing if you're going to live or not, and your whole life changes. And your opinion of everybody else and what all you're wrapped up in right now, it don't, you don't even have enough time to send out a, 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 a bird thing, um, uh, uh, a tweet, you know. <laughs> I'm... I'm I'm flipping out here and I'm flopping and I'm going crazy and that kind of thing. Yeah, you're acting like a bird that just got hit with bird shot. I mean, didn't even have time to, to tweet. And all of a sudden your life changes. Uh, I bet you when you're laying there on that bed, you're hoping that uh, people are praying for you and not talking about you like you've been talking about everybody else. I bet you're hoping that they're using their breath and saying, God, can you help them? And God, can you do something for them? My mom had a, a lot of wisdom about her. She had maybe a different way of putting it across. She never real pushy with it, but she said something, and after she's been gone a while here, I, I miss those things, and they come to mind more frequently since she's gone. But my mom used to say this. She said, son, the best thing for you to do is, is if you don't have something good to say about somebody, then don't say anything at all. That's pretty good wisdom. But it's hard to practice. The reason we talk about other people is because we think we're better than they are. Well, I know somebody that ought to be in on this sermon right now. Me too, you're here. <laughs> Let me show you this in Matthew chapter number 13. Uh, we only got about four minutes. <clears throat> now, this question came up in, uh, um, I started to say vacation Bible school. <laughs> this question came up in uh, questions and answers the other day. Uh, in verse number 10, the Lord's already talked to him about the stony ground and the wayside. The fowls have come along there. In verse number 5, and uh, no deepness of earth. The sun has out scorched the roof and the thorns sprung up. And then talks about the good ground. And he said, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came to him and said, Why speakest thou to them in the parables? And watch this. Now this is profound. And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and it shall be given more abundance. But whosoever hath not, for him it will be taken away, even that uh, he hath. He's not talking about material things. He's talking about wisdom. He's talking about being able to discern, thing, discern things. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And then in fulfilling what Isaiah said over there in the Old Testament there, the people's heart, why? Look at it, the people's heart, verse 15, three times five. The people's what? Heart is wax gross, their ears of dull of hearing, their eyes of closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their... All right, so there you go. You have the secret. He's fixing to give you the parable. And what is he fixing to tell you about? He's fixing to tell you that the issue is, is whether you see and whether you hear, if the ground is no good, it won't bear any fruit. The heart is where you understand things. Understanding simply means not knowledge, not intellect. Most of us nowadays think to know God means to know things about God. To know God is to understand how God's relating whatever you're going through to you and Him. That's understanding. Wisdom is the application of that. 
But understanding is, is God, what are you doing in my life to help me to understand you better as to how these things apply to me and you? Doesn't apply to everybody else. It applies to me. What are you trying to say to me? Not for me to, you to understand parables. You're blind, you can't see. You're deaf, you can't hear. And your heart's hard and cold. So you're never going to get the understanding of it. That principle still applies. Even though you're saved and he gave you the knowledge of God and he gave you the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, don't turn there, but he says, the natural man receives not the things of the spirit for they're spiritually discerned, neither can he know them. Come to Proverbs 3 real quick. Proverbs 3. Now one of the ways that you cut off that communication with the Lord, even though you're saved, Proverbs chapter number 3. And we'll apply it tonight to the book of James. Everybody knows this. Verse 5. I think I remember it. And then it say, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own. In all thy ways acknowledge. Yeah. And he shall direct your. All right? Lean not to thine own understanding. Preacher, what have you been saying for the last 45 minutes? You're living in a world right now that is leaning on their own understanding right. and you're being taught to work out your own problems, to figure it out your own way. Somebody has an answer, somebody has a solution and you spend more time with your nose in the world and the world's books and the worldly, sensual, devilish knowledge as opposed to saying, God, I can't lean on my understanding. Why am I in the situation? You know what you're going to need to know? You're going to need to know about marriage. You're going to need to know about divorce. You're going to need to know about boyfriends. You're going to need to know about girlfriends. You're going to need to know about school. You're going to need to what classes to take. You're going to need to know what decisions to make, what financial decisions to make, whether to pack up and leave because a hurricane's coming or whether or not to stay home, whether to board up a window, don't board up a window, whether to get the car fixed or to get a new car. You're going to need all kinds of things done. You say what? You read what everybody else says and you try to figure that thing out maybe from a financial perspective perspective, you can't put a, you can't figure it out. God said, this is what I want you to do. Here's the way. Walk you in it. Amen. Lord, well, what they require? require a little faith. If you wait on all those decisions, it doesn't require faith. You say, what is that? Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge and he'll direct your path. So the secret to finding myself on the right path is don't lean on what I think I know. Trust in what he knows. That's a hard thing. But it's the right thing. Amen. Lean not to my own understanding. and all my ways acknowledge him. Lord, is this what you want me to do? The world says don't do it. The flesh says don't do it. The devil definitely says, Lord, it's three against one. Lord said, yeah. What's the problem? This is what I want you to do. But Lord, if I don't apply your own understanding, you can't make sense of it. But that requires faith, doesn't it? You better have some deep ground, well plowed up for that seed to go in. Otherwise, you know what you'll be doing? You'll be always making decisions out of the well of your own knowledge. And there ain't no spiritual geniuses in here. The best thing I can tell you to do is, is get your nose between the pages of that book and let God show you and direct your path. And when you do, if even if your method is wrong, if your motive is right, he'll fix your method because you had enough guts to trust him. I just believe the Lord wants me to pack up and go to school, okay? Don't lean on your own understanding. You say, why? I guarantee you they're going to come talk you out of it. It doesn't make sense. Well, it's not accredited. It's not this. It's not that. I think you could use your time better for this and better for that. Your own understanding. You're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for them to instruct you out of what the Bible says. Those teachers are trained to talk you out of trusting God by faith. Churches nowadays, you know what they do? They play into that by teaching you that works prove you're saved. Works don't prove anything. They just keep the machine oiled. They don't prove anything. I know a lot of people that work. Catholics work themselves to death. Mormons outwork everybody. Lost as a golf ball in high weeds. You say, what is that? It just feeds the machine. You play into it. What do I have to do? 
I got to tr- lean not my own understanding. He said, salvation is by grace through faith. That just doesn't make sense to me, preacher. Not. Don't lean on your own understanding. You say, what is an indication? When you're leaning on your own understanding, it's an indication of a ground problem. And I don't mean a wire ground. I mean a ground. I mean a dirt problem. There's a problem with the dirt. And it's not producing the right kind of crop. That passage he gives you about that tree over there, and maybe many people didn't recognize it, but the tree can only produce based upon the ground wherein it's planted. And if the ground's no good, no matter how bad the tree would like to bear fruit, if the ground ain't no good, the seed ain't going to bear, no matter how good the seed is. The seed perfect. The lack of production is not from this. Here it comes, and we're going to take a bathroom break so you can throw up. The problem's the ground. Because that seed wants to produce. The farmer just don't want to work the field. You remember the parable? Fields are wider under harvest. Can the Lord find anybody when he comes? Father, bless your word. I pray you'll be with us in the upcoming service. In the name of Jesus Christ.